Hello, welcome to Omega Matters. I'm Christina, this is Bill, and today we are joined by one of the giants in Omega-3 research, um, Dr. Michael Crawford. He is a professor at the, Imper at the Imperial College London and the director of the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition. He's had many major contributions to the field of nutrition and the brain over his long and productive career. In 1972, he reported evidence that the brain required both arachidonic and docosahexaenoic acids, ARA and DHA, for growth, structure, and function. And now he focuses this on why DHA specifically is required by the brain's neural, neural signaling to function and how to use this information to prevent and treat modern day neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders. He has had an influ, influential career as a scientist, author, and advocate for better nutrition for all through his work with the Mother and Child Foundation and the Little Foundation. He has received about every award possible in his field for good reason. And we welcome Dr. Crawford to Omega Matters. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for all of that. That sounded- Is that about right? Wanted to you were talking about. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so what do you want to know? <laughs> so let's get into it. Um, so we would like to know, we're biologists, not quantum physicists. And we wanna know if you can explain exactly what DHA and arachidonic acid are doing in the brain um, in terms of biologists could understand. What are their main functions? Do they work together? Do they have separate roles? Can you paint a picture of that for us? Oh, cool. Well, that, 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 that's a tall order, but um, yeah. uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, Good. That, uh, sort of 600 million years ago kind of thing. But uh, uh, prior to that, sunlight, was converted into carbohydrates and proteins, and that's about it by the anaerobic systems that lived on the planet. And when the uh, oxygen tension rose as a result of the photolysis of water, and of course the an anaerobic photosynthesis has been going on as well uh, for a long time, and to make um, everything life possible, it all happened very quickly. It's called the Cambrian explosion, where all 32 fire appeared on the planet almost instantly, not quite instantly, but in those kind of terms. Anyway, one of the first things that happened was that uh, <clears throat> instead of converting sunlight into carbohydrates and proteins, the early primitive life forms like, like dinoflagellates as we have today, converted sunlight not into carbohydrates and proteins, but into electricity. <clears throat> and uh, we now know that they used to cause a hexanoic acid to do that. Oh. And um, the, if you would analyze a dinoflagellate today, you will find there's not only stuff full of uh, DHA phosphoglycerides, but it also contains di-DHA phosphoglycerides, the same that you're in your own eyeballs today. Mm -hmm. so, so what happened was that it converted sunlight into electricity. And that, of course, sparked movement, and it sparked the beginning of the nervous system, which eventually, of course, led to the brain. So DHA has, was right in there at the very beginning of the signaling systems of the brain. And it's there today doing exactly the same thing. It's also contributing to the flexibility of the membrane. Arachidonic acid is another story. I don't think that we have the same kind of knowledge about arachidonic acid in the central nervous system as we have about DHA in terms of signaling. But arachidonic acid produces uh, two things. First of all, it's an important component of the uh, inner cell membrane in particular, and is responsible to a large extent for the fluidity of the membrane. It's also quite important in the in things like the glial cells, which are looking after the maintenance of myelin and the neurons and so on and so forth. It's a major contribution to the structure and function of the myelin of, of, of the glial cells. And, and in so doing, it produces all these icosanoids, these hormone-like substances that regulate cell function. So it has quite a different role to play in the brain compared to DHA, which is concerned with signaling 50% of the phosphoglycerides in the photoreceptor. And it's equally 
and high concentration, but not quite so much, of the synapse and the neurons where it handles all the signaling systems. So that mm. really, I think, sums it up. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, to really to take it back to the beginning, that's that's a great overview. Um, so nowadays, there's a lot of focus on omega threes and the brain, um, and we know that we use omega-3 status, you usually look at red blood cell omega-3 status um, to kind of represent tissue status in the body, but we know the brain is kind of different from all the other tissues. So what, to what extent do red blood cell tissue membrane levels reflect brain levels, or is there another marker that refle reflects brain levels um, better than that, I guess? I'm not quite sure of the question. How do we, are we able to um, know how much DHA is in the brain by looking at um, blood levels of DHA? Or does no, that I mean, I mean, we can, uh, Tom Brennan has shown quite clearly that there are different proportions of arachidonic acid and DHA in different regions of the brain. And mm. um, this is quite significant, actually, because we found in, <clears throat> in one of our studies with magnetic resonance that the supplements with rich in DHA actually enhance the development of certain regions, very specific regions that are rich in glucosahexaenoic acid, but not others. So it's a, a, a region specific phenomenon, the same with arachidonic acid. It occurs in greater concentrations in some regions and less in others. And we are yet to really understand all of that that's going on there. Right, was that right. was that in um, in infants or was that in adults where you saw the different changes in the brain uh, structure? Well, the the adult brain is not really much different from the young child's brain, except it's beginning to fall to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I think we know that um, it's been been falling to pieces since about the age of five or six. Uh, which is quite sad, really, because there's a lot of dementia and Alzheimer around. And, um, but the, most of the brain cells divide before you're born, 70% of them. And in fact, when you look at the early development of the brain, it's fascinating because by the time a woman comes to us at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital to report for pregnancy care, usually about 12 weeks, 12 or 13 weeks after conception, the brain cells that are all going to form the cortex and all the important things are already migrating to do so. So it's a very early phenomenon in pregnancy. And, and this has important implications because it means actually that the period between conception and when the mother reports is, is one hell of a lot of stuff is happening really important stuff going from a, you know, a, a fertilized egg to, to what, something that is identifiable as a human with a big brain. It's just phenomenal and it's rapid, very fast. The question that uh, comes up a lot is we talk about the importance of, of DHA and arachidonic, particularly during the conception and, and in utero, maybe the first couple of years. Right. Uh, but can an adult if they increase their DHA intake, can they can that affect their brain DHA levels? Um, I, I think there's a simple answer to that. The answer is yes. Um, that uh, every, the way the brain works is that it recycles stuff. Here we have an interesting thing, especially during the night, rebuilding a lot of networks and things like that, refreshing them more than in a sense. And so, no recycling process is 100% efficient. So that means you're losing DHA all the time. And you're probably losing arachidonic acid all the, as well, although arachidonic acid is easier to replace. So yes, the answer is that it's important to keep, keep up the pressure from decent levels of DHA in your circulation so that the brain can pick up what it needs during this recycling process. And that, that, what that means in some respects, is that the, some of the very important thing is that you should always take a supplement if you're using supplements before you go to sleep. 
because that's when the most recycling of, of long-term memories and things like that is taking place. And, um, that's uh, interesting. So taking it with dinner would be uh, close enough? Uh, well, it depends really? when you have your dinner, but I mean, we have true. dinner at seven o'clock, but we don't go to sleep till about midnight or beyond. No, uh, dinner's too late. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you kind of brought this up in that uh, DHA levels maybe are, or DHA is a little harder to come by than arachidonic acid. And yeah. we were almost philosophically wondering why, why DHA is so much more dependent on diet than arachidonic appears to be. Um, arachidonic seems to have more regulation in the body to maintain levels. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th I think the answer is uh, relatively simple. It, it comes in two, two packets. The first packet is the biosynthesis of DHA and arachidonic acid. <clears throat> the biosynthesis of arachidonic acid, just put very simply, is so much easier. It's only a couple of steps from the linoleic acid. Although for both the um, first um, desaturation of linoleic and alpha linoleic acid upwards um, is rate limiting for both of them. Now, so far as DHA is concerned, it's a much longer path and it meets a hiccup around about getting to the immediate precursor, which is the 22 carbon with five double bonds. And mm -hmm. that has to go through a high energy process that, mm -hmm. that our friend Harold Sprecher described two years ago before it gets to DHA. And if you look at the vegetarian animals, um, the herbivorous animals, they actually can make reasonable amounts of arachidonic acid. But when it comes to DHA, it pulls up at the 22.5. Uh, and you get lots of 22.5, but only a small, tiny amount of DHA. And that's why they have such small brains, you see, and compared to their body size. Now, very small mammals like rats, guinea pigs, hyraxes, and things of that size have got a very fast metabolic rate, so they can make as much as they want and as much as they need for their size. And that's interesting because things like squirrels have a ratio of brain to body size bigger than we have. Mm. <laughs> and, and what happens is that as protein deposition is accelerated with body growth going faster and faster. So the lipids lose out and you get this inability to synthesize DHA with the DPA, the pentanoic acid up there and DHA down there. Mm. And, and, and um, what happens is their brain size just plummets. So that is another very powerful evolutionary argument for the necessity or preformed DHA in the diet. Um, yeah. Not quite so much the same argument for arachidonic acid. Yeah. Is there a role for EPA and D or DPA in the brain? Uh, the DPA is present to a significant amount, not much of it. Uh, EPA, no. Uh, no. EPA no, is, no. Yeah. Uh, in fact, funnily enough, if you look at percentile function, what happens is that um, the placenta concentrates arachidonic acid across the placenta for the fetus. Uh, it concentrates DHA for the fetus, but it sucks back, or alternatively, the, the fetus rejects linoleic acid, mm. and it rejects EPA and DPA in the omega-3 series. Really? So it really, the fetus really only takes up DHA. And um, there's a lot of people talk about biosynthesis of DHA and before birth, but it's really academic because there's so little precursor that gets into the fetus. It's always highly selective for DHA. Mm -hmm. okay. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, I, that kind of answers the question of can ALA provide the needs of DHA, really thinking about vegans and vegetarians and, and how they, when they're pregnant, how do they 
make enough DHA? Well, well, the vegetarians have one great advantage that they don't eat a lot of crap that we exactly. <laughs> omnivorous <laughs> eat from the um, uh, sort of intensively reared animal stuff, which is right. all full of fat and God knows what else. And more fat there than protein in terms of the energy intake from these uh, mistreated animals. Mm. Um, if they were wild animals, it would be a different story. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the benefits are a big plus from that point of view because there's all this thing of competition. Fatty acids all compete with each other. So if you've got a huge amount of non-essential fat, you're going to um, depress the ability to use the essential facts. So and I had another question for you. Um, so you, you were into, or you were studying um, DHA, arachidonate in the early 70s. Um, when, when did the work of Dyerberg and Bang cross your radar? Oh, do you really want to know that? <laughs> <laughs> We could do it off camera if you'd like. Because <laughs> obviously they were in the cardiovascular space and you were in the brain and it just they didn't we didn't talk much in those days. Those 1966, I was at a um, uh, doing some work with Professor Ernst Barone in Uppsala in Sweden, uh -huh. and um, I knew nothing about. Uh, any of this kind of stuff, but having just been working in Africa, I had recognized that, that the, 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 the sort of modern intensively agricultural system that we used in the UK was a load of rubbish by comparison with what we've been eating in Africa. Anyway, um, there was a, a, in Uppsala, they had a regular um, meetings where they invited people and they invited Bang to come and give a talk about heart disease. Now, you may know that the Uppsala people are all into high-powered physical methodologies and all sorts of things, Tazalius and all that kind of, of business. And, and here comes Bang, talking about things like cholesterol and fatty acids and so on and so forth, and um, something mm. I knew nothing about at the time. This is 1966. And um, so it was, it, was, it was really amusing because... <clears throat> Um, like most of the most of the meetings at, at Uppsala, there was a lot of intensive questioning of the speaker. But after Bang had finished his contribution, there was almost total silence. And I was amazed at this. I thought, you know, this revelation about cholesterol and um, hard fats and all this kind of thing and what unsaturated fats did to make it better kind of stuff was absolutely wonderful. And um, but I was very young at the time, so I, I didn't want to make, make a song and dance about anything. And, uh, but then one of the professors um, got up and said, I wonder, Dr. Bang, um, a professor, now I can't remember his name, it's so long ago, but one of the uh, prestigious professors at the uh, Uppsala had just died. And um, he said, I wonder, Professor Bang, um, uh, he, he had just died and he drank a bottle of snaps nearly every day and when we looked at his arteries they were clean he said did perhaps the alcohol dissolve the cholesterol <laughs> so that was my first meeting with Bang <laughs> That's the question. and um, after that so, uh, when we got into the field we had a lot of connection with um, both Deerberg, um, but mostly with Deerberg rather than back. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Well, it's, uh, it's, there's lots we could, uh, of course, talk about beside this, but I think it's time to kind of wrap this, this episode up. We very much appreciate you joining us. Thank you anyway, so much. Great thank you, Michael. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay. Take care. Be well, bye-bye. Be well, you bye. too, bye-bye.